Hi, welcome again to The Rock Pine Town. Today's message is called A Breath from God. I want to start by talking about Luke chapter 22 and I want to go to verse 62. And the Bible says that Peter wept bitterly. He wept bitterly, bitterly because he had felt he had let Christ down. He had let Jesus down. And one of our biggest problems that we come up against in a crisis is ourselves. We often think that we've, we've let Jesus down, we're, we're disappointed. But you know, we often say things that we mean, but when it comes to a little bit of pressure, we don't. And this is the problem. I'll give you an example. Two homeless people sitting on the road. One says to the other one, he said, Mick, he said, if you had two mansions, would you give me one? Mick says, yeah, of course, Pat, I'd give you one. He says, thanks, Mick. He says, Mick, if you had two Mercedes Benz, would you give me one? He says, of course, Pat, I would give you one. He says, Mick, if you had two bottles of beer, would you give me one of them? Ah, oh, Pat, he says, I, I can't, I can't do that. The reason? Because he had two bottles of beer. Often we don't want to give things. We promise things but we don't give things that we've got. One of the things that we've got to learn is to get faith and to give it out to others, people around us. It's easy that sometimes we think it's so, so, so easy, but when a crisis comes, when we start getting squeezed, well, things are a little bit different. Jesus said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Paul, Peter said, my faith in you, Lord, is so deep. He said, I would go to prison for you. I would actually die. I would give my life for you. Peter was so, so sincere, which reminds me of a little cartoon character in the parishers where Charlie Brown had just finished playing tennis and he was beaten. And he comes with his tennis racket and he drops his little head and he says, I cannot believe I lost. I was so, so sincere. But sometimes we can be sincerely wrong. Peter thought he had it together, just like us. We often think we have things that we do, but when crisis comes along, we get a little bit squeezed, a little bit falling apart. Unfortunately, we often believe what we're not. We go into the church and we sing beautiful songs and we get full of faith and we're surrounded by people who all believe the same as what we believe and they're all singing and we're singing full of gusto. But once the pressure comes on, we're not. You see, Adam and Eve thought they could be godly without God and it didn't happen. We, may, we need God in our lives and he made that available through the person of Jesus Christ. We cannot do it in our own strength. Now, if I had preached this sermon a month ago, people would have not really related so much to it. But today, because we are in isolation and because there is a, not only a virus pandemic, but there is a fear pandemic, we will listen and we'll perhaps maybe take some note and, and let's hope it does us some good. Now, let's be honest. We are not what we thought we were. The fact is, though, that we have all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us. Verse 34 in Luke chapter 23, Jesus says, I tell you, therefore, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Jesus was trying to show Peter of his lack of inner resource. Inner resource, that's what we, we also lack. And it is the same with us. We thought we might be stronger and not panic. We think about, we worry today about our lives, our jobs, our future, our families. Do you know what Jesus said? He says, all those things must be second. He says, you've got to put your family behind me, your life behind me, your job behind me. I must come first. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Now we know that, we've read it, we've heard it so many times and we say it and we tell others. But when it really comes to the crunch, do we really do it? 
Well, we all fear, we all panic, we're all doing this. Jesus just told Peter that you're going to deny me three times. Now, some of the songs we do sing are, are amazing. The words of one of the songs we sing, we sing, there's a song called The King is Coming. And, and the verse starts off, the marketplace is empty, no more traffic on the street. Sound familiar? All the builder's tools are idle. There's no more time to harvest wheat. Then we, we get into, and the king is at the gate. Then we go into great gusto and great voice and great song. And we sing, for the king is coming. The king is coming. I have heard the trumpet sound and now his face I see. But you see, here's the thing. Between the marketplace being empty and the king coming, there is a gap. And that gap is where we get the fear that will come in. Now, Peter and his disciples, they had witnessed huge miracles. They had just been to the feeding of the 5,000. They had just collected 12 baskets of scraps. Jesus said, let's go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And they got into their boat. And as they were going across, there was a storm brewing. Now, Peter and his disciples were all, they were fishermen. They knew what, 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 how to read the storms. They knew a storm was coming and we also knew a storm was coming because we've been told that there's a storm coming for years and we're all so prepared, aren't we? Or are we? On the boat, when the storm broke out, Jesus fell asleep and the disciples were so, so scared. They eventually wakened them and they, they shouted to him, Master, Master, don't you care about us? You see, through this crisis and through this panic and through what we are going through, we think that Jesus is asleep. He is with us. He's with us the whole time. In verse 35 of Luke 22, Jesus turns around and he says, Look guys, I sent you out on a mission and I told you what to do, what to take with you. He says, I told you to take nothing with you. You don't take provisions, you don't take money in your wallet or your purse, your handbag or whatever. You don't do anything like that. You just go out and I will provide for you. And he asked them, he said, now, when I sent you out, did you lack, what did you lack? What did you lack? And they replied, nothing. He said, so guys, now what I'm doing saying this time, he says, I want you to go out, but I want you to take everything you can get. Everything you think you need, take it with you. I want you to fill your backpacks up. I want you to have money in your wallet. I want you to put your sandals on. I want you to gird your waist. I want you to take your sword for protection. I want you to go everything that you humanly can do. Take it with you. Now, here's the thing. That from me, when he sent them out on that time, and they went out on their own strength, that happened all the way until... Jesus was nailed to the cross. The journey would take them right up to the foot of the cross. They went to the Garden of Gethsemane and they, Jesus was going through intense spiritual struggle. He took three with him, James, John and Peter. And as they went into the, he said to them, just wait here and pray for a while. Jesus went through enormous agony and anguish. He came back and he saw them asleep. He said, guys, can't you just keep awake a little while? went back again, he prayed, he came back again, he found them asleep again. He said, please, he said, just, just try and stay awake and pray with me. I need your, your support. I need your prayer support. Third time he went back and they were asleep again. Why was that? Because they were doing it in their own strength. They were not doing it in his strength. And often we try to do things in our, our own strength. They couldn't even pray for an hour. We get so much fear coming into us. It sort of paralyzes us. It really gets into the bottom of us. But Jesus really wants to, for us to see who we are. It's like as if he's holding a mirror up with this pandemic and, and he's saying, this is what you're really like. You know, you, you may be great on a Sunday or during the week or with your friends or whatever. You may be good. But when it comes to a bit of squeezing, well, not so good, eh? In Luke 22, from verses 55 through 60, you can read it yourselves. It tells us the story there of Peter denying Christ. It, it comes, first of all, a young maiden sees him sitting at the fire. And, and she says, aren't you one of them? 
And he says, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not. He, I don't even know the guy. He denied Jesus. Then he was approached again. And I said, you are one of them. You were amongst them. He says, no, no, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. He denied the people who were with Christ. He was denying his own brothers and sisters in Christ. And then the third time they said, yeah, you're Galilean. You've got a Galilean accent. You come, you come from Galilee. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. He denied his heritage. Three things. And everyone connected to Jesus and then the cock crowed. Jesus looked at Peter, and Peter knew. Disappointment. Disappointment. This is what a lot of us have been feeling over the last couple of weeks. We're disappointed in ourselves. We're hurt. We, we've got guilt. You know what? When Jesus died for us, he just didn't take our sin away. He took the guilt away as well. But we are wrapped up in guilt. So many of us are guilty and repenting, and, and, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing to repent. But to have that burden of guilt, hmm, that's not what it's about. Peter went, and he's, the Bible says he wept bitterly. And do you know what he could have done? He could have just walked away, but he didn't. He wept bitterly, and he asked for repentance. Then we see a little bit later where Jesus actually appeared, appeared to him. We get to the point we are so disappointed in ourselves, and in our response... And in our thinking, that all we've been taught and all that we have actually spoke to others about not fearing, well, it comes back really to haunt us. Our faith may be shattered. We have heard about the storm coming. We have thought that we would be ready for it. And now we are wringing our hands in fear and worry. And we feel we are in a place now that we've let Jesus down. But let me tell you, in reality, you haven't let him down. We're just coming to grips of who we are. Peter could have just walked away, but he didn't. He denied Jesus. He denied his brothers and sisters. He denied his heritage. But he hung in there, and we've got to hang in there. Paul said when we are weak, he is strong. In the teaching of, of the armor of God, we see that we are not in our own strength. The armor is not our own strength. Ephesians 6 verse 10 tells us that the strength is only in God. It's his strength that we must, his armor we put on. Not our armor, his armor, armor of God. Our armor is Christ. We've got to be in Christ and that's our armor. We have, he's not disappointed with us because I'll tell you why. It wasn't hidden from us. Him. He, did, he saw what we are. It wasn't hidden from him. He saw what was in Peter. It was only Peter who never seen it. It's only us who now see our weaknesses. And after all Peter's weeping and regrets and failings, Jesus appeared to him. Luke 24 verse 34 tells us that he had already appeared to Simon Peter. If we skip now to John chapter 20, verses 19 to 22, we get a, a picture that we will be familiar with. It's a group of Jesus followers, his disciples, isolated in a room full of fear. They're there because they're frightened of the outside world because the, the Judeans on the outside wanted to kill them. They were gripped with fear. Their doors were locked, their windows, no windows. And they just waited. And suddenly, amongst the fear, through the walls, Jesus appeared to them. And the very, very first word that he said to them was peace. Peace. Shalom. What is peace is? He says, look, guys, I'm not at war with you. I'm not offended by what you've done. I bring you the peace. And then he leaned forward and he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. That's what we need. We need the peace of the Holy Spirit. We need God to breathe on us fresh again. Let, let me finish by telling you of a corona, a triple corona. The word corona means crown. 2 Timothy 4 verse 8. Paul tells to Timothy 
that you will receive the crown of righteousness. Why? Because your anticipation of that chorus that we, we were talking about earlier, the King is coming in the return of the Lord Jesus. We will get that crown of righteousness. In James 1 verse 12, he talks about the crown of life. What's that? It's for persevering through this time of tribulation. It's this time of worry and anguish and panic. We will get that crown of, of life. In 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 2 to 4, Peter talks about the crown of glory. Some people say, oh, but that's only for the pastors and the shepherds. We are on the leaders. Well, let's be honest. If you're a Christian, you're a leader because you can lead anybody, your neighbor, Somebody at work, someone in your family, you can lead them to Christ. And that's the crown of glory, the crown of righteousness, the crown of life, and the crown of glory. Now, maybe you've grown cold about Jesus. Maybe you're watching this and you, and you, you, you look, you, were, you used to go to church and, and you used to be more faithful than what you are now. Well, here's what I'm saying to everybody, including the believers. Ask God for a fresh breath. Ask him to breathe on you afresh. Maybe you're fearful in this crisis. Ask him. Ask and you'll receive. Lord, I'm asking you to just breathe on us and give us that fresh hope. Ask God through the Holy Spirit to breathe on you afresh again. Now, when we look at our testimonies, and we often hear some fantastic testimonies. Some people have been brought up in Christian homes and they don't, they say, oh, I haven't really got a great testimony. Trust me, you've got a good testimony because you were once a sinner and now you're saved. And people who say, well, I did this. I give drinking up for Christ. I give smoking up for Christ. I give drugs up for Christ. I give all, I stop murdering people. I did all sorts of things. I give them all up for Christ. You know what? That's not a testimony. You know what a testimony is? A testimony is what Christ has done for you and what he's done for me. When you just start looking back and you count the blessings that you've had, the, the, the miracles that have happened in your life, now that we're in that boat, don't cry out, don't you care about us, but be there and be comfort one another with the words that he's coming soon. So what I'm going to say to you now until next time, shalom, goodbye. And God bless you.